Greetings everyone. I am Omkar Patnaik, the founder and president of the Global Federal League. Today we have with us a very special guest. David Gallup is an attorney who specializes in human rights, world citizenship and world law education. He is the president and general counsel of the World Services Authority, Washington DC, a global public service human rights organization founded in 1954. He is also a board member of Citizens for Global Solutions. CGS team leader of the Peace and Youth Outreach Program and the convener of the World Court of Human Rights Coalition. Gallup has been interviewed by media such as BBC, PRI, The New York Times, The Huffington Post and Foreign Policy. He was interviewed for A Beautiful Mind by biographer Sylvia Nassar and for Cosmopolites: The Coming of the Global Citizen by Atossa Araxia Abrahamian, a senior editor at The Nation. I hope I have pronounced the names correctly. Yes. He received a JD in 1991 from the Washington College of Law, American University in Washington DC, and an AB in French and an AB in history from Washington University in St. Louis, MO, in 1988. He has taken course work towards a MA in International Affairs at the School of International Service, American University, and has spent a year at Université de Caen in France. Was that correct? Yes, that's very good. Excellent pronunciation, Omkar. Thank you. I feel validated now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was looking forward to this interview, Mr. Gallup, and uh, this is sort of a fanboy moment for me because I'm a great fan of Gary Davis and a great fan of the work your organization is doing. And to be able to interact with someone so highly placed in the organization and carrying forward the legacy, someone who has so closely worked with Mr. Davis, it's an honor. Yeah, well, uh, Omkar, it's an honor for me to be speaking with you tonight and with all uh, your audience also to talk about Gary Davis, to talk about the World Service Authority and the human rights work that we do, to talk about world citizenship. And I'm certainly also pleased and thank you for the article that you wrote on Gary Davis about him being a satyagrahi, you know, a, a, an activist, uh, a nonviolent or peace insistent activist. So, uh, David, firstly, how did you become a world federalist and has your perception of the idea changed since then? Yes. Well, uh, during law school, I was studying uh, when I got to choose the classes that I wanted to study, which is usually by the second or half of the second year and into the third year in law school, because the first year you're studying everything that they want you to study. Well, uh, I took international human rights law classes, public international law, refugee law, asylum law, poverty law, uh, immigration law, basically classes that would help me to know everyone's rights and how those rights play out in, in the law and in society. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to do something with my life that was a service to, uh, to others uh, while helping them to understand their rights too. So one of my roles as a human rights lawyer is also a human rights educator and activist to help people to know that they have rights because if you don't know your rights, you can't claim them. Well, so after law school, I was, uh, when I was looking for work, I found the position of general counsel or a chief attorney position at World Service Authority. And that's really where I began to learn uh, about world citizenship and about world federation. Uh, during... Uh, my, while I was studying for my graduate degree in international relations at American University, I had written a paper, and in that paper I had mentioned that I thought there should be some kind of united world organization uh, and beyond the United Nations. And it's funny that the, you know, the world federalists are now Citizens for Global Solutions in the United States or the World Federalist Movement or even the Global Federal League um, all focus on World Federation. And, but originally the name of the World Federalists back in 1947, when they first came together as a larger group was the United World Federalists. And even World Service Authority's original, na original name was uh, United World Service Authority. Um, Gary Davis said that he dropped the, the word United from World Service Authority because he realized actually the world is already united. What is not united is the people of the world who don't yet comprehend that we do have one world one planet, that we are one human family. And that, of course, was the task of the rest of his, his adult life and so far my adult life to educate people that we are already world citizens, but we have to claim it. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're world federalists. And it took some time working at World Service Authority for me to really get a gra uh, grasp on 
the idea of World Federation and what that meant. I mean, I, I understood Federation when it came to what was going on in the United States, uh, you know, the, from the, the colonizers and how they created the constitution and a, and a federation versus a confederation, which originally was separate states that would potentially fight each other until they created a common law beyond them. Uh, and then we, you know, after learning from Gary Davis for many, many years, I worked with him for almost 25 years until he died, and I'm still running the organization that he founded, we would talk about the, this idea of a world federal government, democratic world federal government. And he had a really good friend, uh, a man named Frank Bourne, who was a U.S. State Department officer for many years, but then became the president of the D.C., uh, Washington, D.C. branch of the World Federalist Association. Uh, and we would go to meetings there and I, I learned more about it. But certainly my real foray into this idea of World Federation as it's linked to world citizenship has really been the last five years as I've become also a board member of Citizens for Global Solutions, uh, in, uh, which is a national organ world federalist organization here in the United States. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, I have several roles as a board member, a volunteer really, uh, for that organization. Um, so, I mean, I, for my role now, I feel like, is to provide a link between World Federation and world citizenship, because the idea of world citizenship, it's, uh, I mean, when you ask about how, you know, how this changed, my view changed over time. Well, everybody kind of understands what it means to be a world citizen. That means you have rights and duties or a citizen having rights and duties in a particular community. And when you add world in front of citizen, you're saying, well, that community is now, now global, the, the whole world. Um, but we're all federalist. What is a federalist? <laughs> what is a federation, really? And that's something that's much more uh, relates to political institutions, how we govern or not uh, a community, or in, in this case, the world. So it's a little bit harder to maybe understand the concept of world federation versus world citizen. So now I feel it's really my duty uh, as one of my day-to-day -day jobs, both as, as, a, as president and chief attorney of World Service Authority, but also a board member of Citizens for Global Solutions, to link those two ideas and help people to understand what that, what that really means. But I do get that it can be um, a little bit uh, intimidating at first to, to understand that. But I mean, if you look at what's going on, uh, what has happened over the past 30 or so years, in the European Union uh, and how they became a European Union and not just an economic community. And the reasons for that, of course, are really war, which is also the reason why World Service Authority and the World Citizen Government, uh, of which World Service Authority is the administrative branch, why that was founded was because of the, of the war, uh, the, in, in this particular case, World War II. Yeah, I do agree. I personally find the term world federalism to be very academic in relation to world citizenship. So like, how do you propose we make that a bit more simple and presentable to the public? Well, I think what you are doing in, on social media by having these conversations with people to explain their viewpoint of what it is, that helps people when they hear a conversation like this and know, okay, well, yes, it's, it's an ideology or it's a, it's a political concept, but it's not, when you explain it and what it means and how you compare it to examples like the European Union, of bringing separate states together and having uh, uh, an overarching European Union law, uh, or uh, there's not yet a constitution, there, there will be, I'm sure, one day, or here in the United States, how there is a US constitution, which is uh, an overarching law that means that um, people, whether you're in Illinois or whether you're in California or New York, wherever you might, might find yourself, uh, that there's still a common federal law that says, for example, you can't shoot someone in Illinois and flee to New York. <laughs> because there's, it's it, you know, the idea that, that there's the, a, a crime called murder uh, that is a, a federal crime that basically prevents that, or not prevents it, but it, it, it outlaws it. Uh, and that doesn't exist at the world level. There's no really fed, uh, a world, you know, law crime of, of murder. Um, I mean, yes, that does appear, obviously, in various uh, treaties, declarations, and, and how that is, that kind of crime might be enacted. Um, but the, there is no, yet, not yet, a world law that, that basically outlaws murder, especially if you're wearing a military uniform. You are, in fact, paid to kill. And, and this is what's really scary with things going on in the world that just so happens right now during our conversation, the, the events going on in, in Eastern Europe, for example, mm -hmm. where you can see a, a whole out, outright war. But if someone's wearing a military uniform, does that mean that they can get away with murder? And over the years, it has meant that. Uh, and, the, and, the, and then, of course, there's the issue of the 
what I would say, or what Gary Davis might say, is the failure of, of global government or global governance that doesn't really fully exist yet. I mean, the United Nations is not a world government, and there's been close to 250, if not more, wars since the UN was founded in 1945 to rid the world of the scourge of war. So there's something, there's a disconnect there uh, and how we need to have a brain or the world needs to have a governing structure, which it doesn't yet have. Uh, and that's really, of course, what World Federation is about. And I, th I think when we bring that, that idea down to, to earth, whether it's talking about you know, an impending war perhaps, or talking about the pandemic or other global issues that cannot be handled by one nation or even a few nations by themselves, that idea of, of having a federation and a common world law. So you cannot you know, shoot this, someone on the streets of Baghdad or shoot someone on the streets of New York and, and get away with it. That, that should be considered murder everywhere. Uh, so if you bring down the idea to the level of, of you know, someone's everyday understanding, um, not to talk down to anyone, but to, to make it uh, understandable in a way that you might understand just law in your local community, I think that's what will help. So what you're doing, what the Young World Federals are, do, are doing, what uh, World Service Authority, of course, is doing, as well as other, other groups like Citizens for Global Solutions, the World Federalist Movement, et cetera, are all in an effort to bring this idea through education to the public. Could you tell us a bit about uh, the history, purpose, and the current status of the World Services Authority? Sure. Well, the reason the organization was founded, there's really were three reasons uh, that provide the history behind it. Uh, Gary Davis was a Broadway actor, uh, became famous uh, for standing in for a role uh, for an actor named Danny Kaye. Uh, and this is depicted in the film, The, the World is My Country. As so you can go to theworldismycountry.com and, and see a preview, find out more about that. But he, uh, right at the beginning of World War II, his brother was killed in Salerno on a battleship, which really made him angry. He wanted to bomb Hitler's war factories sort of in, in anger in front, you know, and, and revenge, and vengeful feelings for that. Um, so he enlisted in the, in the Air Corps, the predecessor to the US Air Force. Um, and then, of course, though, when he was up in the in his bomber plane, dropping bombs, you know, from 19,000 feet in the air on cities like Brandenburg and other other cities, uh, he realized, you know, afterwards when he saw the destruction that he was killing the same people he would have rather been entertaining as an actor, as a comedian. And these are his fellow humans. How could he have done that? What kind of remorse he had? So that vengeance turned to sadness, which turned to uh, desire, a desire to make a change in the world, make a change in his own life. And then he happened to read a book, a book called Anatomy of Peace by Emery Rebish, which was a bestseller back in 1945. And this book uh, actually challenges all of the isms, meaning like uh, communism, capitalism, socialism, internationalism, religionism, um, all in favor of creating a world citizen government. I mean, uh, uh, Emory Reeves, Gary would like to quote, quote, always quote Emory Reeves saying, there is no first step to world government. World government is the first step. We just have to claim it. We just have to say this is what we want. It's, it's you want to say it's a social and political choice, but we just have to, to make that choice if we want to have a, a peaceful and just world. So it was really uh, his brother's death, his killing that he did in World War II, and having read that book that, that made him then decide what can I do to get out of this war system? And then of course, of course that film and Gary's book, his memoir, his first book, My Country is the World, which is a quote from, from Thomas Paine, one of the uh, original uh, founders, I guess you could say of the United States of America. Uh, he tells the story of, of why he went to Paris to give up his US passport, which you have to do when you re renounce or give up your citizenship. Uh, and how that, how that whole story played out and what it meant for his life and the rest of his life, actually his entire adult life. Uh, and getting that idea across of what it means to move beyond the nation state, to move beyond the war and the, and the killing that it caused him to do. So it's a great, a great, really powerful, emotional and engaging story that we are trying, we are trying to share, World Service Story is trying to share through that, well, through that film and through our day-to-day -day work, through the documents that we issue, registering people as world citizens. Uh, and uh, I, th I think that probably is enough for me to explain the, the history of the organization. Uh, but there's certain projects that we're working on now that I'm very proud of. 
Uh, for example, our World Court of Human Rights, uh, and I'm the convener of a World Court of Human Rights coalition. We're trying to build organizations, uh, an organizational structure around the world of people who want to have a court uh, of human rights or a court of human and environmental rights, I would actually say. Because uh, why is it desperately needed? Well, 60% uh, of the world's population lives in a part of the world which doesn't even have a regional human rights system. And you know what that region is, Ankar? Yeah, I think so. Because, uh, okay. yes, yes, uh, you're saying something. Oh, well, no, I was saying uh, if you knew what that region was, but the answer is Asia. Asia yeah. is the, the region of the world where uh, more than 60% of the world's population lives. But as you know, there uh, is um, a court uh, for Europe. There's an uh, African Commission in court for the, the many countries in Africa. There's a, an inter-American court. There's even an Arab Charter of Rights. But there is no Asian uh, Human Rights Convention. There's no Asian com Commission or court. So that, that means that if you are, are say, a, a Rohingya uh, uh, um, individual and your village is being burned or you're being persecuted by a government and you have to flee to another country, uh, you can't maybe get any kind of, uh, first of all, redress within that country, but then beyond it, where do you go? There may be nowhere where you could go other than to flee to a different country to find a safe haven or to find justice. So that's the problem, with, such a big problem why we need such, this World Court of Human Rights. So that's something that we're working on. We're gonna be having design team meetings to talk about the statute for the World Court of Human Rights, a statute that was uh, created uh, and, and well, and got unanimous recognition by the, all the chief justices of the Supreme Courts of the world in Lucknow, India. That's why it's called the Treaty of Lucknow. Uh, but it's just a draft statute for now. But we're uh, hoping to very soon expand uh, that to, to make it uh, become a real court, uh, hopefully within the next five to 10 years. Uh, this, that's one project. Um, other things that we continue to do on a day-to-day -day basis is to provide education uh, in uh, fora or uh, forums like this, where we get to talk to the public and to many different people who might see this on, on YouTube. We talk to you know, hundreds of people every week who call or email asking us questions of what it means to be a world citizen or what does it mean to carry a document that identifies you as a world citizen, like, like the world passport or the two versions of the world passport that we, that we offer. Um, so we continue to issue documents of global identification and travel. We have a legal advocacy team and a legal department that provides backup to the documents, to the document holders for those documents in case their document is erroneously rejected. We also have um, uh, students who, uh, who work uh, in, uh, and people who work in our communications department to, through social media to share this idea of world citizenship and, and world federation. Uh, and all, by the way, also our legal department does provide uh, free advocacy to refugees, for example, people in stateless situations, even if they don't have WSA documents, we, we, we do want to help as many people as we can. We do give out a certain number of free or gratis documents to especially refugees and refugee camps who have no way to, to have funding to uh, you know, apply through the, the standard fees that, that normally are requested um, when someone applies for documents. Uh, we also are working in, in other ways. So we have um, a uh, World Citizen Club, which we are launching on high school and university campuses around the world. So if you or your uh, fellow students are interested in creating a World Citizen Club in, in your region, please, by all means, get a hold of us. Uh, you can uh, email us. And the club website is worldcitizenclub.org. Uh, you can find more information there. We're happy to provide you with more information on how you can do that. And it's a way to engage uh, the passion of young people such as yourself in changing the world and becoming peace builders and peacemakers. Because if you can see yourself as a, as a world citizen and understand that we have rights, you can take on a project in your local community, whether it's uh, cleaning up of, of a river or stream, whether it's helping people in a refugee situation, whether it's helping some people in your community who happen to be impoverished, or helping people in another part of the world where there's been sadly some kind of devastating uh, event like like a you know a hurricane or a, a an earthquake or something and figure out how can we help those people in that other part of the world and you can do that in these clubs but it's also meant to be a social a social club too so that students can get together and have 
uh, uh, what I might call an international dinner night where uh, students share food from their particular uh, cultural identity uh, or maybe a language that they might speak, or maybe you watch a documentary, Life, the World is My Country, uh, at club events. So it's not, not only to engage in advocacy, but also to engage in, in, in fun and interesting activities where you can learn you know, from, from your fellow students. So those are some of the things that we're working on right now that uh, I think it's important to share with your audience. And that's very impressive and uh, a series of projects very diverse in nature and uh, I particularly like the world's, uh, World uh, Citizen Clubs, that idea I like and apart from that providing legal assistance to refugees and other people out there who don't uh, have enough resources to afford for legal help in conventional courts, that's really great. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about it. and and. We just need to figure out how maybe with your help or help of other people in the Global Federal League or with other Federalists, we can we could advance this because obviously a, a World Federation is going to require governmental institutions. The part of a federal, you know, the main part of a federation in my mind is to have the, the global governmental institutions that will allow human beings to uh, work together uh, peacefully. I mean, WSA's uh, vision is world peace and justice through world citizenship and world law, but our mission is to educate about human rights uh, and environmental rights, world citizenship, world law, and to create the institutions of law that human beings will need to, to live together peacefully with each other and sustainably with the earth. And to have a, a human rights court to help us with that, that, you know, it, from the from an American perspective, there's a, you know, we see government in as so, sort of a, a tripartite, meaning there are three parts to it. There's uh, the judiciary, which would be what the World Court of Human Rights fits in. There's a legislature, which could be, in the end, a world parliament of the people of the planet, not just of national governments. Uh, and then some kind of world executive council that will help to uh, advance and promote and protect rights and, and the laws that have been created democratically through a world parliament. So coming to the documents issued by the World Services Authority, how acceptable mm -hmm. are they? Like, how many countries recognize them, and how can people apply for the same? Sure. Well, there's been about 96% of all countries have placed visa, entry, or exit stamps and world passports since, and world passport holders' passports since 1954. Uh, and that's, that comes to almost 190 countries that have stamped it. Now, the only way we know that the passport has been recognized is when passport holders mail their passport back for renewal. We look through, you know, we, we flip to the passport and we're like, oh, on that visa page, I see there's a there's a stamp. Um, and so we take a scan of that. We might at, write to the or email the individual and ask for more information about how they got that stamp. Um, and then also when email, uh, passport holders themselves email the copies of the stamps that they get in their travel. So we appreciate when passport holders do that. Um, there are six countries that have officially recognized it, which are Burkina Faso, Ecuador, Mauritania, Tanzania, Togo, and Zambia, but like I said, uh, which should most of the time recognize it, but even those countries, any country at any time could reject uh, any passport, actually, no passport in the world, whether it's the Indian passport, the European passport, the American passport, the Chinese passport, whatever, at any point, one official has the power to say yes to someone or no, for a good reason, like maybe someone has harmed somebody, so they want to stop that person from traveling, right? Or for no reason whatsoever, that they're discriminating against that person due to their ethnicity, their religion, their race, their gender, who knows what, right? Or just because the, the border or immigration official is having a bad day and taking out their anger and frustration on the traveler, right? This, this happens all the time. And we have, we work with, you know, uh, student in can just, uh, you know, maybe you still have an identification document, not even necessarily a passport, but where you can get up and go from um, um, uh, New Delhi, for example, to, and the next day, you know, arrive in uh, Beijing or the next day arrive in Paris and maybe just show your ID, but not be rejected just because you're coming from another part of the world. It would be like here for me, um, you know, I uh, want, if I'm in Washington, D.C., and then I want to go to Virginia or I want to go to New York or something, I can just take a train or a bus or, or, or drive in a car and get there. I don't have to, I, I might show my driver's license perhaps for some reason, just for identification, but no one's going to stop me, right? Because this is all considered one place. And if our country is the world, 
then we should be able to travel where, wherever we want to, whenever we want to, uh, and, and maybe, like I said, show an ID upon arrival, but that's it, not to be rejected because um, a government official says, no, I don't like you know, who you are or what you represent or something, but, you know, just because they're discriminating in a subjective uh, and, and oftentimes economically discriminatory way. I mean, for example, for someone to get to the United States from other parts of the world, you have to potentially prove that you have a home, a car, a family, a job, money in your bank account, something that's going to bring you back to that country after you visit as a tourist, because if you don't have some of those things, you're not going to get a visa. And there are many countries that, that require other people from other countries to get visas, no matter what password is, whether it's the world password or the national one. So for me, I have both a world password and a US password. But if I wanna to go to India, whether it's by, with my world password or my US password, I have to go to a visa service and apply for a visa ahead of time. I cannot just get on a plane uh, and, and arrive at, um, in, in Mumbai. It, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I will be rejected because the airlines will not let me board even if I don't have my visa stamped in my passport. So, you know, all passports are, are really fantasy documents. Every passport, even the world passport, we might say, is 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 not real. It's a human construct. What, Gary Davis used to say that uh, all passports, uh, and no one should have to ever have a passport. You know, a passport, we, the world passport is really an anti-passport. We want to get to a situation where no one ever needs a passport again to exercise their rights that have been uh, affirmed in this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 13, which says everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state, and everyone has the right to leave any country, including one's own, and to return to your to return to one's country. Uh, if that, if we have those rights, the right to leave and the right to freedom within a country, we should be able to go wherever we want to on planet Earth. In fact, what most people don't know is it really wasn't until after World War One, and even really not until after World War II, that any kind of passport was ever required. In fact, Gary Davis, Gary Davis's parents, um, between World War One and World War II, they traveled all over Europe with no passport. So th th this this is really an invention that's not even really a, even a hundred years old, but people think oh, I have to have the passport, you know, this is required. Well, it's only required because we say it is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like a confidence game, just like any, any bill, any, you know, a dollar bill or whatever, a yen or whatever. It's, it's all just a confidence game because it's a human construct that we've created to try to make things maybe function better. But in, in this 21st century, we know we're all human beings. We've seen the earth from outer space. We know it's one planet. We know we're all uh, of the same genus and species, right? Why are we fighting each other and not working together? Just give me a minute. I'll turn the slide here. Sure. <clears throat> I'm audible and visible. Yes. yes. So uh, you believe that passports, they're just like a, a temporary requirement currently. And uh, until the time we get rid of documents like passports and visas, until then we need to have a global alternative to national passports. Well, like I said, I think it's important that someone's identity is not uh, hacked or stolen or tampered with. Obviously, you, you, you want to be able to conduct your day-to-day life, you know, at least from a first world perspective, uh, by being able to transact funds, be able, being able perhaps to own property, being able to go and see a doctor or uh, go to school or other things where you might need to show an ID and say, you know, my name's David or my name's Omkar. I'm not Omkar, I'm David, right? So we need something. It could be your fingerprint. It could be your retina scan. It doesn't have to be this. And at some point, you know, it's going to be this. Right. It's going to be probably on your phone or maybe on your your wristwatch. And of course, a lot of people are afraid that it's going to be, you know, like an embedded chip underneath your skin. That scares me, too, actually, a little bit. Uh, I, I wouldn't want that. But uh, sooner or later, it's going to you know, most people, even in, in remote small villages and towns around the world, you know, several people have mobile phones or a lot of people do. Right. Even if they don't have a laptop or a computer, any kind of computer, they might have a phone and that phone is really a computer. And that could be enough and it will be enough uh, for digital identification, digital self uh, sovereign, you might say, secure uh, identification that we can all uh, rely upon and can use to conduct our day to day lives and interact with each other in a in a safe space. Uh, and that's really what, what we're working on right now, actually, is that kind of thing for, for multiple purposes, for whether it's for voting or um, 
for um, just to, 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 to bring the, the, the physical document into the digital world. And, you know, whether it's using QR codes, whether it's using um, like a blockchain to make this happen, uh, it's going to happen. And we're, we're in that process too. That sounds interesting. And this field, it's very exciting. I'm also terrified of that chip, uh, the idea of having a chip embedded in the body, but it's, it's fascinating to see how technology is progressing in this regard. Coming up to my follow-up question, how can people get uh, registered for World Passport and other documents? Yeah, no, thank you. I, you had asked me that. And I had forgotten to mention that to apply for WSA documents, uh, it's a simple uh, process. You can go to the website, which is worldcitizengov, worldcitizengov, like government, worldcitizengov.org. So it's worldcitizengov.org. And on the homepage, there's several different places where you will see the word apply. You just click on apply. It will take you to a form that's simply online. As long as you have a phone or a laptop or tablet or a computer, you can fill in the information. You can upload your photo, like a selfie, you know, as you stand against a blank wall behind you, a selfie that you've taken. Uh, you can upload your fingerprint or, you know, if you have your national passport or other ID, like a birth certificate or a driver's license, you can upload that to certify who you are. We have to vet every Every applicant to make sure that we're not providing documents to someone who is on some kind of uh, restricted list, like someone who might have been a terrorist or is a terrorist or, or proven to be uh, someone who might be living in a part of the world where there's some kind of restriction or something. So there are, we do vet everyone who we pr provide either a legal service or a documentation service to, uh, to make sure that, that uh, the, the people who are getting these documents uh, are knowing that they have to respect other people's rights if they want their rights respected too. So it's a, a simple process to apply. We encourage people not to just apply for the world passport, but to also register legally, officially and politically as a world citizen, which you can also do on, this, on the same form, or there's a separate section of the worldcitizengov dot org website where you can justify to to register as a world citizen if you want to where you can just email email us the form or even mail it in if you want to if you don't want to use you know a, a phone or, or a laptop or something to do that you could actually post documents to us from any almost anywhere in the world uh, to our offices in washington dc so it's a very simple process um, the, the issuance of the password is a little time consuming, uh, at least unless someone pays an expedite fee to get it done more quickly, which people can do. So it can be done relatively quickly, actually, uh, but we do charge additional fees uh, to cover those additional costs for uh, quicker service or quicker shipping or, or other things like that. That's understandable. And yeah, for the convenience of the viewers, we'll attach all these links in the description so that you can go ahead That's and... Uh, Looking forward to having more people register for the World Passport and looking forward to having one for myself in the near future. Definitely. That'd be great, Omkar. <laughs>